waiting time because we'll probably need every bit of it to get through this. I know the ladies are excited about Saturday and make preparation for it, so we'll keep that in our prayers. Also, this coming Sunday will be the end of our two weeks as far as looking at those who have been proposed as far as additional elders and deacon. So we hope that you've either taken time to speak to these individuals or you already know them well enough uh, to make that plan as far as the future of the church here at Grandview Pines. Uh, the only one I know in addition as far as on our sick list is Beth, at home still, not feeling well. Uh, any updates or new people that we might need to mention? All right. Let's definitely can still continue to remember as we are working toward benevolence as far as helping those in Ukraine. We'll have more to say about that uh, later on uh, at the end of our Bible class. So, it means it's time to begin then. So, let's have a word of prayer as we start. Father, we're grateful and blessed to be able to gather in a place of comfort. We are thankful, Father, that we are blessed to have an opportunity to study Thy Word. Father, as we have opportunity, we pray that we might be students of Thy Word so that we can gain knowledge. But we're thankful for the wisdom that's gathered together here in this class, that we might study together and profit from each other's knowledge. We're grateful, Father, for the Scriptures being preserved for us, that we might read them and study them, and know Thy will. Father, we're still mindful of those throughout our world, especially as we think about the Ukraine, uh, the situation that's going on there, and we pray for safety for individuals, and the conflict and the war that's taking place. We pray, Father, especially for those who are members of Christ Church. We pray for their safety as they go through this, that no harm will come. We pray that they might remain faithful to Thee in whatever comes their way. We are thankful, Father, that we live in a place that is free. We realize, Father, that there are those who still don't take opportunity to benefit from that freedom and gather together. We are blessed. We are thankful for the opportunities that's before us. We pray, Father, that as we study tonight, that we'll do so with hearts that are ready to look at thy truth and to make the application to our lives. Father, we're thankful for the one that we're studying about, Jesus the Christ, for his life, that it was perfect and it was sinless, that he became that sacrifice for us as he died upon the cross and shed his blood. Father, may we always be grateful for that sacrifice Always be mindful of what it cost. We're grateful, Father, for Him, for what He provides for us in this life. May we, Father, be like Him. May we be busy about serving Thee. Help us, Father, to be mindful that we are Thy church. We are to be busy. We are to be servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm not going to lead this song, but it took me a while to find it. It's not in our songbook unless it's by a different name. I looked up under a few different names. Uh, this is all the way back to Christian Hymns number three. How many of you remember using it? Uh, I think that's the one that was being used at Lionville when I obeyed the gospel back in the early 80s. So I'll give you an idea. The song is entitled Beulah Land. Uh, we're in John chapter 2, by the way, if you haven't figured that out. Uh, the song has been changed in the first line now. It reads now, at least in some of the song books, I've reached the land of love divine. Any of you remember the first words that are in the original? Instead of I reached the land of love divine. I've reached the land of corn and wine. I only brought that up because it's part of our lesson. I don't know if they socially thought it was the wrong words and therefore changed them, but the original words are taken from a Old Testament passage that we'll get to a little bit later on. I've reached the land of corn and wine instead of I've reached the land of love divine. John chapter 2. There are copies on the banister if you don't have one. 
Hopefully I didn't supply the answers this time. You had to maybe work on them. I uh, have no idea what I did wrong. It shows my computer literacy that uh, there are also copies, if you didn't get one through email, as far as next week's on continuation in John chapter 2 about the money changers. Uh, Larry pointed out last week as the class was ending when we asked the question about the number of pairs of brothers. He was correct when he's talked about three of them, so I want to clarify that. I had put down or said two as we went through the class, but it is three as you look at James, the brother of Labaius, so there would be two different ones, or three different ones there. We'll read the first five verses and then read the next six. It's only 11 verses, and you would think that that would probably be a quite short class, but it will probably take every minute that we've got. John chapter 2. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. We'll get to the next half of it in just a moment. But hopefully you've worked on your questions and providing the answers. The first one is simply just a matter of geography, of looking at a map. Uh, did you have any problem finding Cana of Galilee? Uh, one no. Any others have difficulty finding it? All right. Uh, as with true of many Bible maps, they try to give to us the location or approximate location, but cities change back and forth. I imagine as you see what's going on in the Ukraine, that many of the cities that have existed there will be done away with. They'll have to be occupied somewhere else. So also with Bible places that they come and go and they change or change names if nothing else. But he gives to us here a Cana of Galilee. And when you look at Joshua chapter 19, you'll see that it's described there. And it's in the territory of the tribe of Asher. So Cana of Galilee, it's talking about the northern section of the land of Palestine. But it does so because there was another Cana that was found farther to the south in what is now Samaria. And so it makes a distinction between the two of them. And the one that's found there is in Joshua chapter 16, verses, verse 8, and then chapter 17 as well. So up to the north, picture in your mind the Sea of Galilee, and that will give you off to the left the territory of Galilee, all the cities that would be there. All right, number two, who was to attend this wedding? And we probably need to clarify it more than anything. It's more than just a wedding. It was a feast that lasted a number of days, usually. And that's why when you have the account in Matthew chapter 25 of the wise and the foolish virgins and them being invited, it's more than just to a special occasion as far as we would say, You've got a wedding that's going to take place Sunday at 6.30, and so you have everything done in a couple of hours, and it's over with. These were feasts that lasted days, and therefore took a lot of preparation to it. So who was invited to come to this wedding feast? Jesus, All right, Jesus was. The disciples, the disciples and, and Mary, his mother. Uh, Keep in mind that Cana of Galilee, if it's in that area, was close to Nazareth or would be close to even Capernaum. Nazareth would be the birth, uh, not the birthplace, but the growing up years of Jesus. Capernaum would then become his headquarters, so to speak. It would be right on the Sea of Galilee. So they were in close proximity, and so it may be that, they, well, probably no doubt, they knew what was who was being married and the feast that was taking place in order for them to be invited to come. 
Much like when Jesus teaches that parable about the wedding feast that takes place and they were sent out to invite all of these people. They didn't come, so he says, go out again into the highways and byways and compel them to come. But see, keep in, our, in your mind the distinction between that kind of a wedding feast and what we have now. Number three, why do you suppose Mary broached this question with Jesus or the problem? Why did she present it to Jesus? They have no wine. Right. We know that he hadn't, hasn't done any miracles. Why? Okay. His time hasn't come, but even within the text, what does it say? This was the first miracle. And so as Larry is saying, uh, up until this time, nothing's been done. But when you look at what's being had been said to Mary all the way back to Luke chapter 2 of his birth and his early beginnings, that she pondered these things in her heart. That is, she was aware of some information about who he was and how special he was and what he would become. So she had some idea about what's taking place. Now in our mind it seems a little bit odd because here she is as Mary, an invited guest, who's speaking up about a problem that, they exi that exists and she doesn't speak to the person in charge. She presents it to her son. And so a distinction as far as some of the things and the way that it's handled so far as far as the problem is concerned. Number four, is or was Jesus being disrespectful when he calls his mother woman? First of all, how many of you would have spoken to your mother that way? Now, first of all, there's no way to know the tone in which it's said, is it? But if we had used it in a disrespectful way, it wouldn't have been a wedding feast. It would probably been a funeral, right? <laughs> no. But is there any way to know? Well, we know that Jesus was sinful, so he wouldn't have said it in a disrespectful way. But how do we know? Is there any biblical usage about the word woman that would show it's not being used in a disrespectful way? One instance is, as he hung upon the cross, he spoke and said, Woman, behold thy son. Now surely in his death he wouldn't have tried to be disrespectful, would he? Any other instances besides his crucifixion? John chapter 4 is another case where if any way that people would have thought it would have been disrespectful because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, Jesus spoke to the woman at the well and He calls her a woman, not being disrespectful to her in any way. I've got a couple of more. Uh, let's see where they are. Uh, Matthew 10, 37 is, uh, no, that's the other passage. Uh, Matthew 15, 28 is one, and John 19, 26, and then in chapter 20, verses 13 and 15. So there's a number of places in which we have it being used. Nothing disrespectful about it. Number five. What does he mean when he says his hour is not yet come? Now Kay used it as an answer as far as the previous question, why he was approached. All right. Initially that may have a part in it, but more often than not, how does he use his hour is not yet come? Right. Teaching in his ministry, but there's even a, a more important part 
that he speaks about his hour, all right, his death, his crucifixion, is the main sense in which he uses this. Now the others are true that as he begins his ministry, begins to teach and preach to those people, but specifically he's having reference to because of what takes place, and we'll get into it next week in the latter part of this chapter, that this wedding, and I'll give you part of the answer to one of the questions, this wedding and the event that surrounds the money changers all has a part to do with what's said at the end of this chapter. And so it's not just that these three accounts or three different things are said together as far as the wedding feast, the money changers, and destroying the temple. They're not just events put together. They have a real meaning of why they're together because of what's being taught and the emphasis that's put there. So his hour really signifies to what he's going to do ultimately upon the cross. Number six, what did Mary tell the servants? All right. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Now this may have seemed out of place if you look at first century and history within that time period as far as the position of a woman. But these are servants and she tells them, you do what he says. So that brings us to the next section. We'll read verses 6 through 11 now. Maybe part of it, but we're going to have an introduction of another person who has more say-so, or at least he thinks he's the one in charge. Beginning at verse 6. And there were set six water pots of stone, after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw now, draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk that which is worse. But now thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So that gets us through the second half of it. Questions still continue. Number seven, what was the regular use for the, the water, really, not just the pots, but the water that was in the pots? All right, purification. Now, not talking necessarily about spiritual purification as they would do if they were approaching the temple. Uh, Matthew chapter 15 gives us an account of where those individuals came to Jesus and said, Why do your disciples not wash hands before they eat? That is, why are they not purifying, cleansing their hands before they sit down to a meal? We know in John chapter 13, what did Jesus do when they came into the upper room? What did He do that no one else did? All right, he washed their feet. And so there was also that type of use of water as well. But these water pots were there for a purpose. Their usual use was water for purification whether it was to cleanse from filth of the flesh or to get them ready as far as John 13 with the feast that was about to take place. Number eight, how much liquid 
And you may, I don't know if you have a translation that translates the word firkin instead of, uh, how much water was a firkin or liquid? How much? Nine gallons? Eleven gallons? Anyone else? Eight? Start auctioning it off in a minute. <laughs> we'll take middle of the road. We'll say ten, okay? That'll make it easy as far as multiplication goes for you. So each one of these pots held two or three. So how much was in one pot? Twenty-five, you split the difference, right? Twenty to thirty, we take the middle twenty-five. That still makes it hard for me to keep up with how many quarters there are as far as going on. So that's one pot. How many all together? Six of them. So that's going to give you how much between the two that we have. If there's 20 in each one, it gives you 120. You have 30 in each one, it gives you 180. That's a lot of liquid. That's a lot of water to begin with in these six pots. So whether you take it even as a smaller amount, because most of the commentaries are written by Englishmen or Americans, and so they try to give it to you in British equivalent or American equivalent, but most of them never get below seven as far as gallons are concerned. But even if you take that, that's still going to be quite a bit as far as fluids, volume-wise. And I meant to, and I forgot to bring a, a, a five-gallon bucket from one of the uh, hardware stores, but most of you realize what they are, right? So if that's five-gallon bucket, then you would have to have two of those for the lower amount of these water pots. Three of them to reach the majority. So imagine just how much that would be as far as fluids. Larry? But if you think about it, it's not really that much. Because these big pieces that they had, they would have 150, 200 people there over a week's time. So if you factor that, it's going to be a lot of people that are going to pay day. That's really not that much. Right. But what we're dealing with, though, is in this one situation, they created that much at one time. But you're correct as far as it being an extended period, however many people might be staying. Uh, we know that we've got Jesus, His disciples, Mary, so we've already got a fairly good-sized wedding guest list. Anything else about the size of the pots? How much they would hold? Okay, number 10. What would you think is the importance, if any, that if they are filled to the brim? Why would it insert that piece of information? All right. They're full. Nothing else can be added to change what's there, is it? Uh, can't put any dye in it. Can't make it change colors. It's filled to the brim. Number 11, the wine was taken to what man? He's called, at least in the King James, by two different names, but really it's the same word. All right, he's either called the governor or the ruler. The governor or the ruler. What was his job, number 12? What would we call him? <laughs> Wedding planner. Wedding planner. <laughs> All right, uh, Jackie brought up master of ceremonies as far as that kind of a situation. He wouldn't be that. Uh, he, he didn't have that much control by his definition of his name as far as looking at the literal meaning of it. Right. 
right. He, he's got a definite responsibility here. Uh, literally, the name means because uh, what type of seating arrangement did they have in the first century? Did they pull up a chair? No. How did they? Uh, they normally were reclining as far as on the ground, tables then in front of them, so it's quite different than our European depictions of the Last Supper. Uh, it's nothing like that. Uh, not even anything like the figures depicted. But his name literally means that he was in charge of three of those seating places. Whether you call them couches or the tables, his name has got a try in it. So whether that means that he was just over those three areas or three different rooms, wherever these people are gathered, he had a specific obligation as far as what his name describes him as being. Number 13. To whom does this ruler or governor then go? All right, to the bridegroom. Uh, we know that within the scriptures... Uh, we talk about the sadness and the sorrow that the disciples felt. And he said that, well, while I'm with you, you can't do that. Uh, there's a distinction between the individuals. The one who's going to be standing by or helping with the groom as far as that goes. All right, number 14. Let me look at my watch right quick. We're going to try to get through the questions specifically uh, because of what this teaching lends itself to as far as looking at some of these. Number 14, can you find passages where the Bible speaks about wine being something favorable? All right. 1 Timothy 5.23 Timothy is told, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. It's something beneficial and helpful to him. The reason behind these two questions is this. The word wine is generic. That is, it can have both positive and negative meanings behind it. Whether it's an Old Testament word or the New Testament word, one being Hebrew and one being Greek. You have to look at the context to see whether or not it's favorable or condemned. Any others that you can think about as far as being favorable? I've got that one in the next section because of the way that it's used. So we'll come back to it in just a moment. Somebody look at Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verses 14 and 15, if you would read, please. There's no, no doubt that he's talking about it in a favorable way here as far as what's being produced. Look at the opposite side of it. I've got a list of them. If you want to get some of these afterwards, we won't go through them right now. But I'll close with this one, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 22, as it speaks about the Lord's Supper. And it makes reference to it. And so that would have to be a favorable situation. All right, passages that are unfavorable or find it being condemned or spoken about in a bad way. 
tonight. A couple of passages in Proverbs. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Then a longer passage, Proverbs 23, verses 25 through 29. The one that Jeremy spoke about as you come to the death of Jesus, Him being on the cross. Two different times it talks about them offering to Him wine. The first one was a mixture from the standpoint that it would become a narcotic and it would work toward easing the pain. He wasn't going to take anything like that. He was going to suffer and endure all of that pain. And so there's a difference between the first and the second time that those things are offered. Very quickly, number 16. Proverbs 3, verse 10. Speaks about new wine. Isaiah 16, verse 10. Talks about they will tread out no wine. Now, these verses initially are showing how that wine can be used of that which is freshly squeezed out of the grapes. A wine press makes what? Grape juice. Because it's squeezing the grapes right there. That's the product that you get is grape juice. There is on the opposite side, Genesis 9.21, the process of where Noah began with a vineyard. And he used that and became drunk by it. And so we see the extremes as far as how that it's used. Number 17, I hope that you looked at Habakkuk 2.15. How does this apply to what's being said here in John chapter 2? He pronounces a woe upon what individual? The one who gives his neighbor drink. Now keep in mind again the amount that we're dealing with that would cause that individual to become drunk. We'll get into some of these things in just a moment. Final one, what are some of the things that's said about wine in Proverbs 23 that's an unfavorable situation? What does it do? All right. Changes the way that you think. Contentions and babbling would be the section that I would put that one under. But first of all, he talks about the woe and the sorrow that it causes. What else? All right. Talks about the dangers of it. And ultimately, he says, it bites and it stings. So he has to be talking about a certain type as far as whether it's alcoholic or not. I wanted to give myself a little bit of time. and uh, If you want this website, I'll, I'll give it to you. They're not writing this from any biblical standpoint. It's written from a health standpoint. And the website is healthline.com as it talks about alcohol. I want to go through this and read it to you because it talks about uh, how this affects the entire body. It says, first of all, meet ethanol, the main player. Now, ethanol sounds to us like it ought to go in our vehicle rather than in a car. Ethanol, also referred to as alcohol, ethyl alcohol, or grain alcohol. Uh, I can speak to this from a personal standpoint. My dad was an alcoholic. It's bad enough for you to think of somebody that will drink processed alcohol, but I've seen him take a bottle of alcohol that we would use for cleaning and drink it. When you hear about people who will take uh, hand sanitizer as it first began to be developed. It had a large percentage of alcohol in it, and people would use it. Ethanol is clear 
colorless liquid. It is a byproduct of plant fermentation. So you get beer from uh, barley, and you've got the hops, that's right. You get wine from grapes. Vodka comes from potatoes. But it's not a process by itself. It has to have another process, that is the fermentation or something added to it to make it change. Here's a closer look. It enters your mouth. As soon as alcohol passes the lips, some of it goes directly into your bloodstream. When you take medicine that's called sublingual, what, what is it? It melts, right. it melts in your mouth, doesn't it? And it goes into your bloodstream. Alcohol has the same effect to begin with. It then goes into your stomach and your small intestines. 20% of the alcohol that one drinks goes into your bloodstream through the stomach. The rest gets into your bloodstream through the small intestine. So, part of the problem when we deal with whether somebody is drunk or not has a lot of factors. One is whether or not you have food in your stomach and whether it's absorbed at a slower rate because of it. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. Then into your bloodstream. So it goes from your mouth into your bloodstream, goes from your stomach into your bloodstream, goes from the small intestines into your bloodstream. Here's where they say, this is where things get intense. Your bloodstream moves your alcohol through your body quickly. Alcohol causes your blood vessels to widen. That causes people to have their red face. A temporary feeling of warmth, a rapid decrease in body temperature, a drop in blood pressure. Alcohol is a depressant. People think they drink to feel that euphoria, but alcohol is a depressant. Next, it goes into your brain and your nervous system. Alcohol can hit pretty fast. From the time that you drink it, how long do you suppose it takes to get to your brain? Less than five minutes. Within ten minutes, you're feeling its effects completely. When it gets into the bloodstream, you start to feel good. But that's not because of the alcohol, it's because of the hormones, the endorphins, and other things that's reacting to it. I like, even though it's probably not what they meant to say, as you get drunker, many times people will say drunkenness is just an exact point. You can drink up to this and then you become drunk. They have this statement a number of times. It's a process, and you get drunker because of it. Therefore, there's slurred speech, loss of coordination, blurred vision, dizziness. Alcohol in your kidneys causes you to release more water. This can lead to dehydration and therefore it makes you even more drunk because there's less water to dilute it within your body. In your lungs. Yes, some alcohol you drink makes it into your lungs. You breathe out about 8% of the alcohol that you drink. That's why they take a breathalyzer test because it's on your breath and they're able to measure the volume that you have within your body. Your liver. When it comes to booze, 
Your liver works hard oxidizing most of that alcohol. Your liver can only oxidize one unit of alcohol per hour. So the more you drink over a shorter period, the more drunk you are. The result is a higher blood alcohol content and a higher risk of alcohol poisoning. And here's where, after we've gone through all of these various organs and how it affects the body, there are so many other things that come to part in this. What affects one person may not affect the other one the same way because of these factors. Number one, your weight. The bigger you are, the more alcohol can go through your body without it affecting you to begin with, to begin with. And I, have, I imagine I know why they say it this way. Your biological sex, male or female. Males and females metabolize alcohol at different rates. Your age. As you age, your metabolism slows. The type of alcohol. Highly concentrated beverages like vodka and gin are absorbed faster by your body. So you become drunk faster. Fizzy and bubbly drinks like champagne and soda mixes are quicker than other drinks. How fast you drink, that is, you just sip on what it is or do you swallow it down quickly? How much food is in your stomach? We mentioned that earlier. If you drink on an empty stomach, the alcohol is absorbed more rapidly. Medications that you may be taking. Certain medications either inhibit or promote the absorption of alcohol. Your overall health, people that might have problems with liver and kidneys, it's going to affect them in a different way. Ethnicity. Asians and, African, uh, Asians and Native Americans Blood alcohol builds up faster. I have no idea why, but it's in the list. Even your emotions, the way that you're feeling. If you're angry, you're upset, problems will affect how it's done. Your moods, illnesses, sleep. Lack of sleep in this study over a four-day period caused two drinks, that is what they measure as alcohol in each drink, two drinks, if you have been without adequate sleep for four days, equals six drinks. Genetics. Children of those who have abused alcohol are four times more likely to also develop alcoholism. Brethren, I don't know how to say it any clearer. With all of these factors, we better leave it alone. The scriptures nowhere promote even social drinking. If so, how many of us would promote social drug use? Use a little bit of opium. Use a little bit of heroin. Go ahead and misuse prescription drugs. It's just a social situation, isn't it? Who makes up the standard of the norm for what's social? We can't. God makes those standards. The situation in John chapter 2, when it came to the end, this man has not become inebriated because he knows the difference between the taste. Being around my dad enough, 
Sooner or later, it didn't matter to him what he was drinking. He didn't care. It didn't matter the taste of it. Because the drunker an individual gets, the more inebriated they get, the less they care about it. Because they lose their sense of taste, they lose their sense of reasoning. The Scriptures, this passage does not promote the social use of that which is intoxicating. Very quickly, it wasn't until the 8th century that they developed the process of distillation. What is distillation or distilling alcohol? Taking the water out and making it more potent. At the very best, within the New Testament, it was a small degree compared to what is possible now. It's nothing like anything at all that we see today. In the first century, it was possible for fermentation to be kept from happening. They could seal it in such a way that it would not have anything to react to it to cause it to ferment and become alcohol. There are a couple of good books, and I'll uh, put them out as far as on the Internet. One is by W.D. Jeffcoat. I uh, can't remember the name of the, uh, the first one that I have, but it's just a small book. It's called Bible Wines. And these show that it's possible and even preferable in the New Testament times for wine not to be alcoholic as we see now because of what it produces and how it changes an individual. I'll close because uh, people are standing. Any comments or questions right quick? Might address them later. Right. But I important to know this this passage is used to argue for social drinking in the church and it's used to try to argue, I guess, that there was no intoxicating wine present in the first century. And I don't think either end of the spectrum is where we need to be necessarily. It's very clear in, in the New Testament and scripture in general that drunkenness is provisioned by God. Right. It would, but even from the standpoint that we see here, uh, the uh, lack of evidence for what's taking place. I right, appreciate it much. Don't forget to pick up one of the copies for next week if you haven't gotten one. If you get your songbook and mark number 911, that will be the song of invitation after Brother Jeremy presents the lesson. 911.
And after you have that marked, if you would turn to 885, that will be the psalm before his lesson, 885. And before we get into that, I have a request of each of you. Ask Brother Kelvin if he would say a prayer after I make my request to you, and he's going to do that. But over the past two years, we each know all the problems we've gone through, the world has gone through with the pandemic. And now Russia has invaded Ukraine, and Brother Clunch will talk more about that at the close of service this evening, uh, about what we're trying to do to help the people over there, the Christians. But even though the fighting is about 5,500 miles away. It still directly affects each one of us. One of the topics of conversation when I came in the building tonight was just how fast the price of gas was going up. As the price of gas goes up, everything else gets short supplies. They start diverting things around. So my request is, is this that we look out and watch and check on each other. You know, in times of inclement weather, we always say check on the old folks. Well, during this particular situation, age is not a determining factor in who gets hurt. As a matter of fact, I would say our young folks are getting hurt worse than us old folks on this one. I don't work. My truck can stay in the driveway for two or three days without moving. My son drives 30 miles a day. Jeremy drives many miles a day. So the request is simple. Check on each other. Make sure that everybody is doing okay. That is what Christ wants us to do. That's what the Bible tells us to do, is look out for one another. Brother Kevin, would you say a prayer for us, please? Let's bow. <clears throat> well, Father God in heaven, we come now to you with humble heads and bowed heads. We pray, Father God, for the situation that we're in with Ukraine and uh, all the many problems that it's causing across this habitation. Uh, we pray, O oh God, for uh, those who are already struggling, Father, financially, uh, health-wise, and we pray, Father God, that uh, whatever's going on in Ukraine and Russia, uh, we will uh, come together uh, and help those who are in need. Uh, we pray for those, Father, who may be in need and reluctant to ask that they not be uh, stubborn at this time, uh, but they come asking uh, their brothers and sisters in Christ uh, without uh, prejudice to help in these difficult times. Uh, we need you more now, Father, uh, to help us as we call on you, uh, for we know not always what to ask for uh, as we face these dangerous times, uh, but you know already what we need. And we're asking in the name of Jesus on tonight that you bless us, Father, with the things that you see we each stand in the need of. But more importantly, Father, you have told us it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we ask that in these times we do give uh, all that we can, Father, for the betterment, the health uh, of our brothers and sisters and all those, Father, who need us uh, in this community and around this world. Uh, we thank you for the power of prayer. We thank you for allowing us to lay these petitions at thy feet. And we know, Father, that uh, you will come and see about us and help us through these difficult times, and especially the brotherhood, Father, who's in Ukraine and out throughout this land and country. Uh, we pray, Father, that they will not lose faith, uh, that you will strengthen them where they're weak and build them each up on every leaning side. Uh, we again thank you for Jesus tonight who made it all possible by shedding his blood upon the cross, 
that we through him might have a life eternal. We through him might have the power of prayer that we may be able to ask you these things, knowing, Father, that you will bless us uh, as you see fit. Uh, we thank you for all you have done and all we know you will continue to do for each and every one of us. This is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 885, the first and last stanza. <clears throat> we read of a place that's called heaven. Remember back to October of last year, our gospel meeting here dealt with uh, lessons in lyrics or lessons from song, however you want to say it. And I almost picked this song I'm about to tell you uh, for, for my lesson topic. I didn't because I like the other one better, but um, I want to share this with you this week for, for the two reasons we'll mention in a moment. But the song is the wise one, right? We all know this song, we grew up singing it, we teach it to our children. The wise man built his house on a rock. Why? Because he didn't want his house to fall down. And the foolish man built his house where? On the sand, right? And because of that, his house fell. We all know the song. But I heard it sung in a different way uh, beginning of last week. We always say, the last part of the song, we always sing it, at least here, build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Great message, have no problem with that at all. They changed exactly one thing. Instead of saying house, they use the word life. Build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't change the message in any way, but it hit me differently. Um, because that's what we as Christians are supposed to do. Every day, every choice that we make should be with that in mind, that Christ is our foundation. Um, and it's little things like that, that that tend to catch my attention. Um, didn't hurt, but this was um, sung by a man who was a missionary overseas, um, and he was teaching a two and three year old class at the time. Um, it was, again, just something that I, I caught my attention and I wanted to share with you. 
um, for, for these two reasons. Falling hurts. If you didn't know that, surprise. Um, first reason, I took a fall last week. You can't really tell it now, or at least not much, but this whole arm was scratched up. I felt like I was gonna lose my leg below the knee. Um, I really kind of wanted it gone at that point. Um, but falling hurts physically. It's not pleasant. But as bad as a physical fall is, a spiritual fall is unexplainably worse. Because when we fall spiritually, you and I commit sin. And sin separates us from God. And if we are separated from God, we are lost. And if we are lost, the only eternal destination we can have is hell. Falling hurts. You should avoid it at all costs. Not telling you something you don't already know. But how does one avoid falling spiritually? You make sure your foundation is solid. That's why I fell last week. I trusted something uh, that I thought was solid. The ground um, wasn't. And it went out from under me and I landed on top of it. But spiritually, we need to know the choices we are making are based on the right thing, on God's word and on the way he teaches us to live. So that's point number one. Understand why falling happens. Number two, from the same incident. I'm not entirely certain how I would have gotten up that day. Because we ended up in the parking lot. Uh, I would have been run over by a car uh, had they not been paying attention. Um, Alyssa had both girls by the hand, and she can't lift me up right now. Uh, so here I am laying on the asphalt. Um, and out of nowhere come these two police officers. Right? I don't know where they've been. I know they were in the store we were in just a minute ago, um, and they were there faster than I could explain the situation. <coughs> they did a quick check to make sure nothing was broken, because um, it sure felt like it was at the moment. But um, and then they pulled me right up off the ground, uh, and not only that, they helped me to the car because they didn't want me to fall again. Why am I sharing that with you? It's not because it was my favorite day, it wasn't. Um, but because that's how we need to be with each other, spiritually, physically too, but spiritually as well. We all know falling happens. Sin is something that is going to be a part of each of our lives. We need to be able to help each other up. But not only help each other up, to make sure that we're okay. And to stay with each other until we get where we're going. It's an important lesson to remember. It's wonderful and great and fantastic to be there when somebody needs you. But are you there the day after? Are you there the week after? The month after, we can't just assume, oh, they're okay now. That's not the way it works. We have to continue to be there for each other, just like Christ is there for us every day, in every way, strengthening us and encouraging us to live right. But you only know that if you spend time with it. You have to study God's word to understand what he has done and is doing for you. And once you understand that, it makes living right much easier. 
because you keep that as your focus and you're working towards something that is good and solid and helpful. So we need to not only be there for ourselves, but be there for each other and an encouragement and help in, in every way possible. Those are the two things I wanted to share with you. And I also want to let you know that that's what God has done for us. That's why Matthew 7 exists when he talks about the wise and the foolish man. Being wise doesn't mean you understand everything there is to understand. It means you know where to go to find the right answer. For us spiritually, that's here in God's word. And it's available for us anytime we want to use it. We just have to make a choice to. To become a Christian, you have to believe in God's word and then do what it says. It's not enough if you don't obey it. And that means repenting of sin, confessing that Christ is God's son, and yes, baptism, immersion in water. Only through those things can sin be forgiven. But we often forget or don't stress enough that that's just the beginning. And one must continue to be faithful to God. And when we're not, we have to take the initiative and make it right. We have to confess our sins and then pray for forgiveness. Because that is what God allows us to do. And once we've done those things, as hard as it is to believe sometimes, we are right with God and heaven is our eternal home. Obeying God is not a difficult thing to understand. Sometimes it's difficult to do. Often we make mistakes. We're going to fall. God gives us a way to make that right. He gives us his son and each other to help us out clean the fall. And he checks on us all the time. If there's anything that we as a church can do for you to help you begin your life with Christ, or if you need our help in any other way, please let us know as we sing this song of invitation. Bring Christ your broken life. times that invitations are hard to listen to. That may be probably the hardest as a parent or as a grandparent, specifically as a father. You'd like to be there all the time as your children fall. But I can't be. Much as I might like to have been there that day, I wasn't. But the great news is that we have a Father in Heaven who can be there at all times for us. 
that regardless of how we fall, he wants to help us back up. We appreciate that Emma's feeling well enough to be back tonight. We want to continue to keep Beth in our prayers as she's not feeling well. Numerous others. Uh, this is probably one of the larger attendances we've had in a while, as we've spoken about the last couple of years and the way that it's affected things. We're glad that you're here, and hopefully that we'll all strive to be present each and every opportunity that we can at uh, our Bible classes and at our worship. Larry made mention of the fact that I would speak a few things about the Ukraine. Uh, thanks to your generosity, your giving, uh, as it relates all the way back to the storms that went through Kentucky, uh, we have enough finances that we're going to use it in two different areas as far as the Philippines, which were hit by a tsunami and a bad storm. They're still in the process of rebuilding there because of this. They're stuck on small <laughs> islands where uh, this missionary is doing most of his work in six or seven different areas to help rebuild uh, homes for members of the congregation, uh, church buildings, that like. But also now as we think about the Ukraine, we've been in contact with a couple of different uh, works. One, the missionary, Mark Posey, who has just gotten back. But I also received some information uh, about another missionary. Uh, his name is Gary Workman. He's living in Arlington, Texas. And I'm not sure this is just me guessing at the uh, name of his wife. She's European, and I think that I've been told that she's probably Ukrainian. Uh, great news out of all of this. He said at his last report, and this is on March the 5th, so just a few days ago, that he didn't know of any Christians who had been killed so far. That's the great news. That's what we want to continue to pray for. I think it was Jeremy who told me uh, that he saw a report or maybe even a Facebook, some kind of, that as they met for this past Lord's Day, that many of the men were telling their wives and their children goodbye because they were leaving to, to escape to Poland or wherever it is that they might find safety. We have an opportunity, but we wanted to make certain because of what kind of supplies do they have, how are they getting things there, and we've pretty much been guaranteed that they're able to help the Christians specifically in Ukraine, but others as they have opportunity as well, Galatians 6.10. But that's all because of you that we're able to do this. It's because you love and you, you're concerned about others. We thank you for that and appreciate it. We're going to be doing this in the next day or two as far as making sure we have things finalized and that things are going to be handled in the right way as, as much as possible. We know that any time the church helps, that they're at the mercy sometimes of governments and individuals who might not see the best interest for those that need the benevolence, we're going to do the best that we can to make sure the Lord's money is used in the right way. We wanted to pass that information on to you and let you know that we're working toward having that done and as soon as possible we would. Larry, do you have... Don't forget that this coming Lord's Day uh, gives us the conclusion of the two weeks that we proposed as far as looking at those men who are uh, up for being added to the eldership and one to fill in as far as with the deacons uh, working with them. We hope that you've given great prayer and consideration to it. That if you have any questions that you've talked to these men or presented it to the elders, if you have a deeper concern, but please be prayerful about that. Brother Jeremy, I think you have our closing prayer. If you would, let's be standing. Let's pray. Father, we come before you once again as we anticipate leaving here and heading back out into the world thankful that we were able to be here for this period of respite from the worldly issues and harms and things going on outside of these doors father we're thankful for the ability to come here and worship and study your word in peace thankful so much for the family that we have here that we can rely on for comfort and encouragement each and every day father we are so thankful as we consider the the harm and all the hurt that's happening in Ukraine, that the report that 
none of our brothers and sisters in Christ have been killed at this time. And Father, we pray for their continued safety as they strive to either remain in place or leave the country. And Father, as we consider those men, our brethren, that are being forced to join that fight, Father, we pray for their safety and comfort at this time. Father, we're thankful for the men who have been selected as qualified to be elders, to be added to that group here. And Father, for the one who will be a deacon as well, we pray for their health. We pray for their strength and their faith as they take on this work. Father, we're so thankful for the ability that we have to consider heaven our home one day as we have that great hope through salvation that is given because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Father, we pray that you will help us to keep our eyes on Christ and our eyes on heaven, that we might always do those things that you've commanded us to do, continue to strive to be about our mission here, which is to evangelize, to spread the good news to those around us. Father, we're so thankful for Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.